Welcome to Central Christian Church and welcome to our Sunday worship. Wherever you are, wherever you find yourself in this moment, thank you for taking some time to worship God and to worship God with us. I get to start off this Sunday, this worship experience, with some really exciting news. Maybe you got, received my email on Friday. If not, and you live in the Danbury area, you'll be receiving a letter um, in tomorrow or on Tuesday. And it is simply to announce that we are reopening Central Christian Church. It's been over a year since we last gathered together for physical worship inside the sanctuary, and it's time that we start to come back together again. After meeting with the church board and meeting with the reopening committee, we've decided to make Easter Sunday our first Sunday back. I am looking forward to celebrating resurrection with you, and then following our Sunday service, we'll be then moving to the lawn to celebrate with an Easter egg hunt and an Easter celebration. So really looking forward to, to being back with you all. It's been a long year, and I look forward to really celebrating on Easter Sunday. That being said, we are still in the midst of a pandemic, and it's not quite over yet, even though um, there are more and more signs of hope every single day. Um, but we are still in a pandemic, so we are taking a few precautions um, that you will see listed um, listed in the letter, in the email, and, and just generally, just so you know, we are going to be uh, mandating that everyone wear masks. We're also going to be keeping the sanctuary to 50% capacity, as well as a few other changes to make sure we can ensure uh, social distancing and things of that sort, just to keep us safe and well. We're also going to have all the windows and doors open just to ensure circulation. So there's a couple of changes. It won't be exactly like it was before we had to, had to uh, physically distance ourselves, but it is an opportunity for us to come back and to, to worship, praise, and, and do all the sorts of things that we love to do together as a community once again. Um, so in order to help us out, because Easter Sunday is generally a, a highly attended service, so um, just to help us out, we are asking that you let us know that you're coming and how many people you will be coming with. That's so that we can kind of plan how we're going to space out the sanctuary. So you can find, our, if you go to our website, www.centralchristianchurchdanbury.com, you can see two buttons. One button is to register um, for worship. Now this will, it's just a simple form, three questions for your name, how many people are coming, and if you have any children, 10 and under, that will be coming with you. And um, you, can, you can fill out that form there. If you, do, if you forget to fill out the form, um, you can still come. Don't let that stop you. But it just allows us to, to have an idea of who's going to be coming and how many people will be coming with you. Um, on the, uh, the other button that is available on our website is for Easter lilies. We would are really hopeful that we're going to get to uh, fill out the sanctuary and make it festive for the Easter Easter Sunday. And one way we're going to do that is by having Easter lilies like we traditionally do in the sanctuary. So um, if you would like to buy an Easter lily for the church, um, they are $9 this year. And you can um, pay for them either through our website, um, which is uh, through our, our Givelify, and then also you can just mail a check to our church here at Central Christian Church here at um, 71 West Street in Danbury, Connecticut, 06810. You can mail a check and just let us know how many you would like to purchase. And those will be available for you to take after the church service is over. So really excited to, to be back with you, really excited to have this place decked out and looking, looking great and just to be able to celebrate resurrection with you as a community. For those of you who are out of town, those of you who still might not feel comfortable coming into worship, we are going to be to live streaming the service. And so um, you can still find us here um, at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. So that will be, we're gonna continue doing that um, uh, for as long as I'm here. <laughs> we're going to try to make that a, a constant in our life here as a church. So we really look forward to Easter Sunday. And with that being said, uh, let us start off today through worship and praise and really giving God, giving ourselves over to God in this moment. There's no one. 
I invite you to join me now for the prayers of the people. Loving God, holy God, God who meets us where we are, God who extends your hand to us in an act of, of grace and mercy and peace, God who sent Jesus into our lives to teach us, to shape us, to show us how to be in greater communion with you. It is with great joy that we look forward to Easter Sunday. Look forward to your resurrection. Look forward to not only celebrating your son conquering the grave, but also to being back together as a community. It's been a long, tough year, O oh Lord. But we thank you that we've been able to traverse our way through it. So Lord, we just pray that we don't let this past year just go by, but we learn from it. We're transformed by it. And that we take the lessons from this period and we instill them in our daily lives from now and henceforth. Lord, we continue to lift up all those who are struggling from the loss that this pandemic has brought. We lift up to you those who are still acquiring the virus and still suffering from the virus, those who had the virus so long ago but can't seem to shake the symptoms. Lord, we just pray that you will continue to keep us all safe, that you will continue to keep us all well, and that we will be able to receive the vaccine and receive the care that each one of us need in a fair and equitable way. Lord, we thank you for the miracle that is this life. We thank you for the, the breath that we breathe each and every moment. We thank you for the signs of hope that are starting to surround us with the advent of spring, with the birds' calls and the green grass that's starting to sprout, with the, the leaves that are starting to 
arrive on trees. Lord, there's just a, sim- a sense of hope with the warm, that the warm weather, the warm spring air brings with it. Lord, allow that feeling to infect our lives. And as we traverse through this, this season of Lent, allow it to sustain us as we go through these final weeks of Lent. Let us not allow these last few weeks to go by without deepening our relationship with you. Lord, give us the strength to, to give ourselves over to you, to be able to admit our faults, to be able to, to shed our egos, our, to be able to, to really dig in to our relationship. And so, O oh God, on this fourth Sunday of Lent, we thank you for the opportunity to go on this journey to the cross so that we can truly know what resurrection is like. Lord, we pray all of this in your Son's name. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes out of the book of Numbers. We're reading from the 21st chapter, verses 4 through 9. Numbers 21, 4 through 9. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Today we are continuing our Lenten series titled Through, and today I'd like to speak on the theme of the healing in front of our faces, the healing in front of our faces. Lord God, we just come to you now in this moment of proclamation. Let us hear your word and let our lives be changed. Let us find healing wherever it comes and let us know that it comes from you. Amen. Perhaps you have been going through something and you just can't escape it. It hurts, it's draining, and you're sick of it. But it not only hurts, it's not only draining, but it feels like you're in an ocean with no floor and the waves keep battering and battering and battering your spirit. When we're going through something that's awful like this, we often try various means to release us from that pain. Find a way to to get rid of that pain or to not notice that pain. And very often we look at the wrong places to get rid of it. Sometimes we look for chemical answers. We escape in a bottle or a pill and, and the pain is eased momentarily. But we know that it always comes back. Sometimes we look for answers in others. We seek out gurus and self-help books, but so often the the, the advice we get only puts on a band-aid and at some point the wound gets scratched and it starts to bleed again. Sometimes we just refuse to believe that it's happening at all. We disassociate ourselves from it or we compartmentalize, compartmentalize it. And sometimes we look for scapegoats. Whether it's true or not, we place blame or our hurt on, or our struggle on other people. Other people who we've decided are the cause of our hurt and our pain. Well, that's what we see in our story of the Israelites in the wilderness this morning. For 40 years, they've been wandering in the wilderness. Forty years, yes, they had these, uh, these initial miracles, these miracles that came in the form of the signs from God in order to get Pharaoh to, to release them from slavery. Then we got the splitting of the Red Sea. And then we saw the manna being given to the Israelites from heaven. But that was a long time ago. 
Life has been a constant struggle ever since then. Walking in a large group in in difficult conditions around a never-ending wilderness, eating the same manna for every meal every day for 40 years, seeing a generation of elders who who were the ones to come out of Egypt, not, not, not making it to the promised land. And now they find themselves retracing their steps and walking back towards the Red Sea instead of towards the promised land of Canaan. The people of Israel are frustrated. They're tired. They're hurting. And while they have traditionally taken it out on Moses, this time, they not only take it out on Moses, but they also take it out on God. It's never a great idea to take out your aggression by speaking against God. Yes, you should share your anger. Yes, you should shake your fist. Yes, you should do whatever you need to do to let God know what you are experiencing. But speaking against God and accusing God of of leaving you to die, you might want to reflect a little bit before you go down that route. Especially when your God has delivered you from slavery, provided you food and water, and just handed you a victory in battle like, he, like God had just done previous to this scripture reading. It didn't take long for the Israelites to know that they messed up. Numbers says that the Lord sent poisonous snakes into the people's camp, and they started to bite people, and many died. Can you imagine what that must have been like? to have this inundation of snakes. And, 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 and the people knew that they messed up. They knew they messed up because they went back to Moses and they admitted that they had sinned. They admitted that they sinned and they asked Moses to, to pray to the Lord to take away the snakes. See, but here's where the story gets interesting, and here's where I think there is a lesson for us. Instead of taking the snakes away, instead of stopping the snakes from biting the people, instead of not allowing the bites to be poisonous, God told Moses to create an image of a poisonous snake and place it on a pole. Then when anyone gets bit, they can just cast their eyes on this image and they will be healed. They will live. Now, to me, that's interesting. I don't know if if it was interesting to you, but it's interesting because when you look at it, God didn't take away the plague. God didn't take away the pain of the plague. God had them look at the plague in order to find healing from the plague. Let me say that again. God didn't take away the plague. God didn't take away the pain of the plague. God had them look at the plague in order to find healing from the plague. I could say it a different way, a slightly different way. The perpetrator still struck. The strike still hurt. But the healing came when the victim looked face to face with the perpetrator that caused the pain. That seems like such a strange thing for God to do. A strange way for God to provide healing. Why didn't God just accept their apology and remove the pain? Why didn't God just hear, why doesn't God just hear our prayers and make everything good? It's a valid question that requires serious thought. There's been so much pain in this world, so much hurting collectively and individually. Why doesn't God just just shake God's magic wand and make everything better? This is a question that people have asked for generations, for ever since uh, uh, since they've understood that God existed. And I think one answer might come from this story. And I think that answer would be proposed like this. Sometimes our pain is the source of our healing. 
Sometimes our pain is the source of our healing. Sometimes in order to live, we have to confront that which is providing our pain, that which is supplying our hurt. I'll say that again. Sometimes our pain is the source of our healing. And sometimes in order to live, we have to confront that which is providing our pain or supplying our hurt. Now, oh, what do I mean by this? The therapist and the trauma specialist, um, Resma Menachem, he's a, a, a therapist who wrote a book called My Grandmother's Hands, which is, focuses on, on body trauma and dealing with trauma that's, that's stored in our bodies. Well, he writes about the difference between clean pain and dirty pain. Dirty pain, he says, is the pain of avoidance, of blame, and of denial. He writes that we feel the trauma, we feel the hurt and the pain, and we either run away from it, find a, a scapegoat for it, or ref we refuse to believe that it's even happening to us. It's kind of like we don't want to deal with it. We don't want to go through that pain of, of walking and living in that pain for a moment. We just want to, to get rid of it. We do everything that we can to avoid it or to not confront it. And paradoxically, Menachem says that when we do this, we actually prolong the pain in ourselves and or we create it for others by acting out of, of our wounded selves. So by not dealing with the pain that we, that, that, that we are experiencing, not confronting the pain that, that is, that is, that is not, confronting what the source of our pain, which is usually within us somewhere, then we actually cause the pain to be prolonged, to go on and on and on, or we hurt other people, and probably both. We probably hurt other people because we're acting, we're living out of our wounded selves. So that's, that's dirty pain. That's what we see, the, the, um, we see all around us. People living out of their wounded selves because they, they don't confront face to face with the pain that they're experiencing. Clean pain, however, is the exact opposite. Clean pain is confronting the pain, confronting the hurt, confronting the trauma that, that we experience within. Menachem writes that clean pain is the pain you experience when you know exactly what you need, when you need, what you need to say or do when you really, really don't want to say or do it, and when you do it anyway. It's also the pain you experience when you have no idea what to do, when you're scared or worried about what might happen, and when you step forward into the unknown anyway with honesty and vulnerability. It's when you know what you're going to do is going to hurt, or when you don't really know what's going to happen once you enter into that pain, but you do it in anyways with honesty and vulnerability. That's what clean pain is. It's confronting the hurt, confronting the pain that's inside of us. But when we do that, confronting that, that, that pain face to face, that's what heals us. It's what heals us. It's, it's when we have that confrontation with the pain, with the hurt. That confrontation is what heal, heals us. But it doesn't just heal us. It actually transforms us. We tap into places and into resilience that we didn't even know we had. We learn so much about ourselves. We learn so much about the world. We actually see the world in, 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 with different glasses. And so we learn so much more about the world we live, about ourselves. And we become better for it. We become transformed by it. Now, as was mentioned, it's, doing this is scary and it's hard work. And if the wounds are deep and if the trauma is debilitating, you might not want to do this by yourself. You might want to, to invite a professional to help you. You might want to find a therapist or someone trained to help you walk through these things because once you bring it up, it can be, it can be very traumatizing, be very debilitating. But, but by, by living in that pain, that's where you find the source of healing. That healing is right in front of our faces. It's right within us. 
See, I think we as humans are generally too quick to lean into our dirty pain. We don't want to experience pain. We want to run away from it. We want to avoid it. We want to scapegoat others, say it's their fault. And we don't want to confront our pain face to face. But God knows what God is doing. So we might not have expected God to heal the Israelites the way that God did it. God didn't take away the snakes, didn't take away the bites, didn't take away the pain of the bites. God forced the Israelites to confront that which was causing them pain. And I believe oftentimes if we're going through something, we need to lean on God, ask for strength, and then confront the source of our pain face to face. Because oftentimes our healing is right in front of our face, is right within us. If we're, if we're brave enough and vulnerable enough and honest enough to step into our pain so that we can heal from it and be transformed by it, then we will know what it means to be truly whole, to be truly healed, I invite you to live in to your clean pain and find the healing that you need to find, which is laying right in front of our faces. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.
We move now to the table, this table that was set for us by Christ himself, this table that invites us to, into communion with Jesus, with God, and with each other. It's at this table that we learn about our mission in the world, that we learn about our instruction to live out the ministry of Christ in our everyday lives. It's a table that reminds us that we are not idle spectators. We're not meant to just understand in a mental way what God wants from us. We're supposed to take part in the ministry to live it out for we are one with Jesus and Jesus is one with us and we are all one with God and so I invite you to this table now let us begin in prayer Lord God thank you for this moment to come to your table for this moment for us to be together as one body in you in Christ Lord if there's anything that is making us feel unworthy of being at this table in this moment I ask that you Remind us that we are simply loved because we are here, because we are your children. You will invite us to this table to take us into the fold, to envelop us into your being, and to invite us to go out and share that love with others. So God, we thank you for this table. We thank you for your son. And we thank you for these lessons which you are providing us during this season of Lent. Amen. It was on the night of his arrest when Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room for a meal. And at this meal, before the meal began, he took a piece of bread. He gave thanks for it. He blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Take, eat and do so in remembrance of me. I invite you to take the bread. And then after dinner, Jesus took the cup. He lifted the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood for every time you drink it. Do so in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until the Lord comes again. Amen. I invite you to Join me in closing this time of communion out with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Central, I really am looking forward to being with you on Easter Sunday physically. But before that, I look forward to joining you on noon on Wednesday on Instagram Live on our Instagram channel, where um, we will have a midday motivation, a midday midweek motivation. In the meantime, Central, know that oftentimes the healing that we are craving, the healing that we really are looking forward to is right in front of our face. Oftentimes we just have to go internal and lean into the pain that we're feeling in order to find our healing. I invite you to find ways to do that as you continue your journey in deepening your relationship with God during this Lenten season. Central, go now in the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.